Well, the Indian vote has spoken and for the first time in 30 years, the message is loud and clear. Narendra Modi will be India's first Prime Minister outside the Nehru Gandhi family to lead the nation with a simple majority. Good evening. Thanks very much for joining us on our special coverage of India Business Hour on this historic day for India. I'm Shireen Bhan. A centre-right government is in power with a strong mandate. What does this mean for India and for the Indian economy? Does a stable government mean faster growth? To discuss all that and more, we're now joined by a star panel of experts, Chanda Kochar of ICICI Bank. Former RBI Governor and Director with Brookings India, Shubir Gokharan, Pavan Munjal of Hero Motor Corp, Ashok Vadhava of Ambit Holdings, Ajay Sriram, President of CII, and in a bit we'll be joined by Geeta Gopinath from Harvard University, Sanjay Thakkar of KPMG from London, and Jagdish Bhagwati of Columbia University from New York. Uh, appreciate all of you joining us here. Shubir Gokharan, let me start by asking you, uh, what happens now as far as the rupee, as far as interest rates are concerned? The twin deficits at this point in time under control, maybe not so much the fiscal deficit because one can quibble about window dressing, but on the key issues of managing the rupee, managing inflation and the current account deficit, what do you expect? Well, I think uh, you, you gave me an undue promotion, so you, know, you need to change that. Uh, you, you referred to me as former governor. Sorry, for, sorry, my, my, my mistake. Former, yeah, former always, deputy uh, governor of the RBI. To, to, to get undue credit. <laughs> Uh, but uh, you know, talking about the macro situation, I think we've got some relief on the uh, current account deficit as a result of things that the government did uh, last year. But this is temporary relief. This is not structural yeah. change. The two big pressure points on the current account are gold. Uh, gold. Well, gold is, is, is what helped to, to yeah. ease it. So you know, we might get back into a gold uh, import binge later. But uh, coal and iron ore are the two big new pressure points that emerged over the last couple of years and we haven't done anything to solve uh, we, we have a little bit of movement on iron ore yeah. uh, and i think that's that's very promising but we need to get back to a situation where we're exporting uh, at peak six billion mm. plus we're not doing that we're no, nowhere close to it now and coal we are ex importing uh, eight nine billion yeah. perhaps more uh, which is what we should be digging out of our own reserves uh, so i think unless we address the mineral uh, stress uh, we're not going to get an enduring solution to the current account. It's it's great that it is now you know within con within uh, control, yeah. but I think we need uh, structural solutions to this. We can't let ourselves be vulnerable to uh, it going way above three percent of GDP. I think that's sure. that's something we need to. I'll manage. talk to you about the rupee and uh, and about the fiscal deficit and interest rates in just a bit. But let me go across to Chanda Kocher. Chanda Kocher, what does this decisive mandate now mean for the economy? All kinds of wish lists have already started pouring in from com corporate India. But what does this mean now for economic growth, for revival, for credit offtake? Well, I think uh, b given the fact that it's really a clear mandate, uh, you know, the first impact it could have is bring back a whole lot of decision making in the environment, which means that approvals could come in for stuck projects, uh, you know, their linkages to raw materials, etc., could come in. So all that decision making. Uh, could actually release a lot of productivity in the system and that could bring back growth. Uh, the second is that, uh, you know, clarity around taxation, tax regime, uh, retrospective versus prospective tax changes, etc., could actually bring back a lot of confidence amongst the global investors. Uh, the third, of course, is that uh, a lo lot of long-term policy measures need to be put in place, whether it's to do with easing supply constraints, uh, to ease inflation, create employment, but those are longer term. But I think in the immediate term, quick decision making, clarity around tax regimes, I think this is what should bring back confidence. I just want to prod you on the immediate bucket, Chanda, because you know we do know what they need to do in terms of the long-term structural problems that India faces, but just on the immediate bucket, the top three items that you would like them to focus on to fuel growth. So really to give approvals to all those projects and investments that are stuck uh, because, you know, uh, lakhs of crores of money is invested in projects that are stuck. Uh, there's uh, more than 20,000 megawatts of power capacity that is uh, implemented but not producing. So uh, take project by project, give clearances uh, with a lot of coordination between the center and the state governments to make sure that these projects start producing. That's the first thing that can bring back growth. Uh, the second is uh, also bring decision making within the bureaucracy uh, and you know clear a lot of those pending payments, et cetera, that are pending from the government entities to the private sector. 
the third is uh, actually to kickstart the implementation of GST again, which can bring back a lot, bring in a lot of vibrancy uh, in the domestic economy. And the fourth is really give clarity around tax regimes. I think some of these things can just bring a lot of cash flow, momentum, confidence, and capital flows into the country. I'll come back to you, Chanda, on the tax clarity that is required, which has been part of uh, everybody's manifesto and how the government can perhaps address that. But Ashok Vadva, uh, over to you now in Washington. The mandate has been much more decisive than what was expected. The polls had directionally given the NDA victory, but this kind of comprehensive win was perhaps not anticipated. How do you see the markets reacting from here on? We've seen the, the knee-jerk reaction We've seen the run-up rally that, uh, that has taken the market to 25,000, in fact, crossing 25,000 today at new record highs. Uh, now what do you see as far as the market reaction is concerned? Well, I guess there is euphoria for present. Uh, the euphoria is not just because uh, BJP or Mr. Modi is uh, coming to power, but I think the euphoria is as much on the fact that the Indian public for the first time in many years has chosen to give a single party a significant majority. So BJP on its own can form the government and of course with its pre-poll allies it's likely to now be in the 325 to 335 range. Uh, that effectively means that uh, you know Mr. Modi and BJP can take decisive actions related to the development of Indian economy and addressing several of the issues that have been bot bottlenecks both for encouraging Indian uh, business and Indian manufacturing as well as for supporting greater amount of foreign direct investment which wishes to uh, come to India. Okay, so FDI uh, and the possibility of that making its way into India. But let me ask you, Ashok, given how we've already seen a significant rally uh, and now we've got this comprehensive mandate, the next big economic trigger, of course credit policy on the second and then the budget, how much more room do you see for an upside for the markets ahead of the budget? I think there are going to be several events between now and the announcement of the budget. The first one, of course, is the formation of the, of the cabinet itself. Uh, the, the constituency or the constitution of that cabinet will play an important role on how the market looks at, at uh, policy making, decision making, uh, who the candidates are, and, and, and obviously uh, that will have some effect, hopefully positive, on the market from here onwards. And then, of course, uh, the, the planning for the budget and the budget itself, um, you know, given that the government will have a relatively short period before announcing the budget 2014, uh, I don't expect a big bang reform coming through there. But again, just the messaging in terms of wanting to address the critical issues, uh, you know, make sure that all these tax issues that have been hanging fire for such a long time. You know, I was, I'm, I'm here in New York and I met a few investors and, and everybody has to say some horror story about India's, uh, uh, India's uh, tax management. Um, and, and I think those issues need to get addressed. Um, and they can get addressed in the short period to the budget. Uh, clarity on foreign direct investment. Uh, some early signals of how Mr. Modi plans to support manufacturing. And of course, addressing of, uh, of the infrastructure, particularly the power-related issues. So, so that messaging is going to be critical, and depending on what the budget contains by way of that messaging, you could see uh, a more consistent uh, performance by the market from, from here to the next year. All right, it's interesting to hear that horror stories related to taxation continue to dominate boardroom conversation in New York. Uh, Ashok Vaz, I'll come back to you. Geeta Gopinath, Harvard University. Uh, thanks very much for joining us here on CNBC TV 18. You know, we've been getting a bunch of opinion, and most uh, uh, people that we've spoken with are optimistic and confident about the India story from here on. The former chairman of uh, Goldman Sachs, Jim O'Neill, just a short while ago speaking to me on my show, said that there is a case for India to be re-rated. Given the economic context, uh, the macroeconomic situation at this point in time, Geeta, what are your thoughts on the road ahead and the imperatives for the new government? Uh, thanks, Yuri. Um, the mandate that the, uh, that the BJP and the Modi has got has been so outstanding that the first thing is they're going to have to hit the ground running. I mean, it has to be uh, completely obvious to, to everybody who's watching them that they're going to deliver on their mandate of good governance and, uh, and uh, an effective governance. Uh, so, you know, they're going to have very few excuses. I mean, you know, there was this concern initially that 
they might not get a very strong mandate and they'd have to have alliances and that could be a problem, but they don't have those excuses anymore, so they have to hit the ground running. So we're going to have to see some really concrete steps being taken in the next, uh, next few weeks. So overall, uh, I think I agree with your panelists that uh, you know, the, the, the policies that have to be undertaken, I mean, we all agree on the same thing. I mean, investment has to be revived. Investment growth is now at 1%, is extremely low, and it has to be brought back up. Uh, how, do, how do we do that? Well, we have, to be, uh, we have to fix the problems with retroactive taxation. We have to have a very clear tax policy. We have to get rid of policy uncertainty more generally. And, more, and it's not just tax, but also the corruption at the various levels that one has to go through to get your project approved to implement it. I mean, those kinds of uh, corruption-related issues have to also be uh, dealt with immediately. So when and if we see, I mean, in the next kind of 10 speeches coming out of the uh, Modi government, I really want to hear very concrete steps on how they actually want to deal with all these issues. Okay, uh, you know, we, we want to hear concrete steps from the government as well, but I have you and Shubir Gokharan here with me. Let me start by asking you, Shubir, as far as the rupee is concerned, and because we've seen uh, dollar inflows being strong, we've seen the rupee appreciate, the sense perhaps is uh, that we won't see too much appreciation from here on, and that the Reserve Bank should actually step in and try and defend the rupee at these levels because it will hurt our competitiveness. What's your own sense as far as the rupee is concerned and possible RBI? Well, interest? I think the vulnerability that the rupee faced and actually suffered from over the last three years was essentially the result of the, of the big current account deficit. Capital flows were in and out. Of course, there was a shock uh, when the taper was announced, so that was a right. particularly bad period. But the growing current account deficit is what added to the volume of the rupee. Now, when you've got the current account deficit under some sort of check, I think the prospect is for rupee stability, and that, along with the expectation that this government What's is going to get What's the range that you see? Uh, I think uh, we are in the range that it's likely to stabilize. So you don't see a sharp appreciation from uh, here? It could, it could, but not, not terribly sharp. I think the current account deficit is still, you know, it's still there. It's not gone away. Do you think uh, that now the case uh, for reversing those measures as far as gold imports are concerned, we are going to see I, I activity think, on that? I think we'll have to test the waters there. I think it, it, it makes sense not to try and force the, or not to induce the gold trade to move into the organized sector. We're already seeing signs of that. Uh, you know, seizures are going up and so on. There's an estimated large amount of, uh, of gold coming in through the yeah. informal channel. So we've got to get it back onto the market, perhaps do it gradually, do it in a calibrated way. But that's going to increase the current account deficits. The vulnerability is still there. Uh, I think in order to defend that, there is some case for uh, for shoring up the reserves that, uh, you know, we've lost. But that's, that's also happening, it looks like, it when you look at the numbers. Mm. But bottom line is that unless we get the current account deficits to a sustainably low number, you know, 2%, yeah between 2 and 3 percent is, I think, a uh, reasonable range. Uh, the rupee volume is going to continue. Uh, allowing it to appreciate clearly uh, has merit from the viewpoint of inflation control. But bad but news for competitiveness and Bad exports. news for competitiveness. So that's, that's a balancing yeah. act which, uh, which has to be made. I mean, there are pros and cons. It's difficult to come down decisively on one side Gita, of that. Gita, come argument. in on this conversation as far as the rupee's vulnerability is concerned and issues related to the current account deficit. And also, given where uh, the global context is about inflows into India. Right. So... Uh, so firstly, about the rupee, I mean, an important player in determining the value of the rupee is the, is the RBI. And so uh, I'm going to hope to see very uh, strong statements coming out saying that they have fully endorsed uh, Raghuram Rajan as the, as the governor, and that's the way it's going to be. Uh, so that's going to be uh, crucial to keeping the value of the rupee, uh, keep, keeping the value of the rupee strong. Now, in the short run, I mean, in the next year or so, it's possible that the current account deficit could uh, deteriorate in the sense that there could be a bigger deficit. Uh, and that would be a natural consequence if growth were to revise, because as investment goes up, uh, and we know, the difference, we know that the current account is the difference between the savings and uh, investment. So as investment goes up, uh, which would be a good thing for the economy, uh, a, a, a so-called worsening of the current account deficit should actually be, in, in some sense, welcome. So I'm not so worried about the current account at this point. It's actually not at a, at a high level at all. Uh, the rupee could strengthen. Now, the truth of the matter is that the rupee is at a level right now where the Indian uh, goods are actually fairly competitive. But at the same time, we haven't seen exports from India take off. And the reason we haven't seen exports from India take off, I mean, besides demand side factors, is that there are such strong supply constraints. I mean, there are huge capacity constraints in India. So 
The fact that the rupee is cheaper and there is a demand that exists for in Indian goods is not enough. I mean, there is the price at which you can actually increase your production significantly just it goes up very sharply. So uh, the issues on kind of removing supply bo side, side bottlenecks, improving infrastructure, uh, re you know, revitalizing manufacturing, all of these uh, things have to be dealt with. Right. Uh, uh, let me bring in a point of view from industry as well. Uh, Pavan Munjal of Hero Motor Corp, uh, the largest two-wheeler manufacturer, joins us now. Mr. Munjal, appreciate you joining us here on CNBC TV 18. You know, the auto industry has been in doldrums. Uh, uh, it's seen the worst phase uh, in the last couple of, uh, at least in the last 12 months. What is the wish list as far as the new government is concerned? I would imagine that a continuation of the excise duty reduction would be top on the agenda. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not just hoping, but I'm, I'm very clearly, very strongly urging the new government which is going to come into power to, to make sure that they carry everyone along with them, all the states with, with, with opposition uh, governments in there, and, and as, you, as you rightly said, to have a council, a new council, and to take everyone along and make sure that CST is brought into place. Okay, so you, uh, you know, those are some of the key reforms that you expect the government will take forward. But in terms of labor laws, which has been the big bugbear, and a lot of the conversation that I've been having with people seem to suggest that the next 12 to 18 months is, uh, is usually the honeymoon period for a new government. And given the fact that the political mandate that this government enjoys is significant, maybe we will see some movement as far as labor laws are concerned. Companies who have not put in investments when the economy was slow, when the industry was slow, I think are, are going to be uh, losing out because those like us who put in investments when the economy was slow, when the market was not growing, looking forward, looking into the future and, and putting our bets on the future, I think we'll be very, very much ready when the demand picks up, when the growth comes back into the market. And those who have not put in investment, I'm sure they will now definitely come forward and put an investment. We need, we need very quickly to see a positive sentiment in the market, which will definitely bring in uh, consumers and buyers coming back. All right, positive investor sentiment is what you're hoping for. Tulsi Tanti, I'm sure that that is what uh, you're hoping for as well, specifically in terms of boosting investor confidence, of uh, getting people to invest and for a restart as far as the investment cycle is concerned, what would you like to see? I think it's the most important for our country. As you know, the 350 million population doesn't have access of energy. I think that is the biggest uh, challenge for all of us. It's a high priority how we can bring the stability on the investment front in the renewable sectors, and particularly the power sector and the infrastructure sector. It will strongly boost our economy in a more long term in a sustainable way. I think that is the most uh, important things are required. By this uh, new government, I strongly believe because of the, the strong majority and the same time is the stable majority, the stable government will bring the sustainable development for the energy sector, which can bring the most affordable and the energy for all. I think that will be the highest. Uh the experience. Mr. Tanti, given the experience in Gujarat, what do you expect now as far as the power sector, and especially uh, you know, the, the renewable sector is concerned uh, in terms of incentivization? Do you expect that perhaps in, in the very first budget, in the maiden budget itself, we are going to see a big push? I think I strongly uh, say in the Gujarat is 24 by 7, it's the strong energy is available for all. That is the biggest uh, achievement in the Gujarat. The same time is the highest contribution from the renewable energy, particular wind and solar has contributed and giving the, the more sustainable homegrown energy, it's giving a very good uh, stability in the state of Gujarat and in the Gujarat economy. Now it is a time for our, us for the whole India basis and that will reform the very, very strongly. The topmost is the, the pricing of the energy because that is giving a long-term consistent policy by the state. It gives the stability to invest and to attract the investment for the renewable or any power sector. I think that is the, the priority. The second is the, the All India basis is the renewable energy policy is very important to bring the 20% the energy mix in our energy uh, portfolio. 
into the, our country, I think that should will bring the way the, the vibrant uh, Gujarat, I would like to see the vibrant uh, India. All right. Uh, that is, of course, uh, what the hope is going to be for, uh, for the country. But Ajay Sriram, the president of the Confederation of Indian Industry, joins us as well. Mr. Sriram, what are you hoping for in the first 100 days of the new Modi government? What are the things that you believe we are likely to see in terms of tangible objectives, uh, meaningful action over the next 100 days? Look, I'll be honest with you. I think running the government and running a country is not something which can take decisions happening overnight. But I think initiation of steps to actually lay the foundation for change is what is required today. I think some of the areas, if I may say, where the government can take a decision fast, I don't know whether it's 100 days or a little more than that. For instance, one, one uh, issue which has created a negative sentiment for investments is the retrospective taxes. I think that needs a change very fast. That needs to be looked at. Second is ease of doing business. Today, India ranks 134 out of 180 odd countries in ease of doing business. We have to improve that position. Uh, we, in fact, in CII have done a study to see what are the best practices in all states in India. And rather than reinvent the wheel, can we just copy what one state is doing better than another state? Third, I think, which needs to be worked on rapidly is how do we improve the communication, decision-making, implementation between center and states. I think states are becoming much more independent in a way. We need to give them more autonomy, yet we need to have a connect. Uh, one of the factors which again should be initiated very fast is the GST, the goods and services tax. In our view, that will increase the GDP by almost one and a half, two percent. It will bring in a lot more transaction in the books. It will ease doing business between states. So I think some of these, plus on the agriculture side, the APMC Act, there are so many of these things that need to be reworked on very fast. Uh, GST is certainly not going to be part of the 100-day agenda. Arvind Panagria, who may in fact move to Delhi, uh, seems to suggest that perhaps GST, a definitive timeline, could be presented in the budget, and that could be two years. But, uh, you know, one of the big challenges, Mr. Sriram, is going to be expectation management. I mean, you know, you all are drawing up these long wish lists. Everyone is sending in their laundry list of what needs to be done, how do you fix this broken economy, and so on and so forth. But tempering expectations, is that going to be one of the biggest challenges facing Narendra Modi? I think, as I mentioned a little earlier, the, India is too large a country, too complex a country to expect 100 days to sort out problems. And there is no magic wand. It will take time. But I think initiation of change is what is more important. Laying down milestones, laying down directions, laying down responsibilities, laying down time frames. I think time has to become an important measure of implementation. And time has to become an important measure of costs to actually give it that focus. Because unless and until we actually, you know, do projects, etc., in a business-like way, we can't have, for instance, let me take an example of clearances. We've had the POSCO project now for seven, eight years. You know, how can projects like that work? We have to say yes or no. Let's decide one way or the other. I think it's a known fact. Two things. One, all decisions will not be correct. That's the reality of life. Second, everyone will not agree with all decisions taken by the government. But that doesn't matter. I think let's move ahead, implement decisions. Eight may be accepted, two may not be, does not matter. Let's move ahead and implement to take the nation forward, to make the change visible, and to actually lead for faster economic growth. Yeah, you know, either take a decision or don't take a decision, but it, whatever it is, uh, right or wrong, we, we should at least move forward. But uh, before I go into the commercial break, should we go, Karan, let me ask you as far as the inflation situation is concerned and interest rates. Uh, because, you know, the hope is that come the 2nd of June in the credit policy, Raghuram Rajan is going to oblige <laughs> with a rate cut. Uh, that is what the BJP would like it to do. I'm sure. But, you know, maybe... As, as did the UPA. Absolutely. Yeah. But, you know, maybe this is a Volcker-Reagan kind of situation where Narendra Modi should be like Reagan and back uh, Raghuram Rajan and say this is not the time for a rate cut. I, I think the RBI has now very explicitly committed to the consumer price index as the benchmark. That index is still very stubborn, still very rigid. Uh, we still have inflation over 8%. Uh, in this situation, it's virtually impossible to 
lower rates because that's going to uh, reflect or impact credibility very strongly. So I think we've got to look at it from the other side, which is why is inflation so stubborn? Why yeah. is it so sticky? And it comes back to the basic structural issue of agriculture. Of the whole food economy requires major fixing. Again, it comes back to the point about, you know, we can't do this overnight. There isn't yeah. one switch you can, yeah. one button you can press yeah. and get food inflation off. But until we get some visibility on what the government is going to do with food inflation, I think it becomes very difficult for the RBI to suddenly turn uh, you know, a monetary policy on its head and say, hey, look, let's stop worrying yeah. about inflation now. Let's bring interest rates down to support growth. Uh, the onus is clearly in the government's court. It has been for the last five years, and we've got to see some decisive action there as well. So that is, I think, uh, the only way we're going to get visibility or, or, or uh, mm. relief on interest rates is when we start to see some credible action on what is going to bring food inflation down. Geeta Gopinath, I just want you to comment as far as the inflation picture is concerned. Uh, and, you know, I was having an interesting conversation with uh, Richard Sharma, and this is something that City has been talking about, that perhaps this is a situation, uh, you know, a Volcker-Reagan-like situation, where uh, Modi will just have to back Raghuram Rajan and say, we know inflation is a worry at this point in time, and it may be the, it may be the populist thing to do to, to tinker with rates and move lower, but, you know, I'll support you and I'll back you uh, every step of the way, because uh, it's just not the right thing to do at this point in time. Oh, I agree. Uh, I think that they should let the RBI do what it's doing. Uh, the way they can help is actually to complement what the RBI is doing. Uh, the problem that's been the case in the last few years is that the RBI has been going it alone. There's been no supply-side policies to support bringing inflation down. There's been no control on the fiscal deficit. Uh, what the uh, new government should do is to exactly spur supply-side policies to uh, kind of bring back the Fiscal Responsibility Act and give it uh, more teeth and so that you actually have uh, a clear uh, caps on deficit spending. Uh, so it can kind of complement what the RBI is doing. It should certainly not interfere with the RBI's uh, policy. Okay, let me very quickly bring in Chanda Kocher of ICICI Bank into this conversation as far as inflation is concerned. Before I take a break, Chanda, uh, on inflation, given where uh, uh, interest rates are and given where inflation is, do you believe that there is any possibility of any kind of a reduction at this point in time? Interest rates are always an important parameter uh, for growth. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, if you look at the inflation and the inflation trends currently, uh, while in the medium and the long term the direction of interest rates would be declining interest rates, but I think immediately for some time the interest rates will remain stable. I actually think that in the first half of this fiscal year interest rates would more or less remain where they are. And uh, if we actually do these decisions, which I'm talking about, and release production and supply in the economy, I guess that can give inflation some respite and that can give some room, uh, you know, to the monetary policy to bring infl interest rates down. But uh, I think for some time, uh, interest rates will actually remain stable. All right, for some time, don't expect a cut as far as interest rates are concerned. On that note, I am going to have to take a quick commercial break, but we will continue our special conversation on the special edition of India Business Hour in a minute. Welcome back. You're watching our special coverage here on India Business Hour. We're trying to decode the victory of the Narendra Modi government, what it means for the economy and what it means for India and the road ahead. Uh, Sanjay Thakur of KPMG joins us now from London to give us a perspective <coughs> on how foreign investors are going to view India. Sanjay, thanks very much for joining us. Uh, you know, the usual bugbear in terms of the retrospective taxation and that requires to be corrected by the next government. but. Be that as it may, given the political mandate this government enjoys and given where we are currently today, how confident are you feeling about the India story and what is the best investment case for India today? Well, I think I'm feeling very confident about the India story and I think when I talk to um, uh, foreign investors and, and, and ask them about their views on India, they're all feeling very confident. And this isn't about the politics of who came in, who didn't. I think that the, the thing that really encourages investors is the fact that uh, the government has a clear mandate. And that means that, you know, that uh, the government can be decisive. And, uh, and that's something that you haven't had in India for 30 years. So 
Um, so, so that's a real positive. I guess the big challenge will be that if this government does not deliver, it does not have the excuse of hiding behind you know, the structure of its uh, mandate as, as an excuse for indecision or, or not, uh, not pushing through reform. So um, in summary, I think I feel very positive and I think uh, foreign investors feel pretty good at the moment. So what are foreign investors going to be looking for specifically in terms of immediate objectives that they would like from this government? What exactly will foreign investors be looking for? Well, I think the thing that's really important is that when you think about foreign investors in India, foreign investors are not sort of looking at a three-year three horizon or four, four five-year horizon. They're looking at a very long ten-year horizon. If I'm going to invest in India, you know, I need to know that, you know, that the, uh, you know, that the foundations that are laid today are going to bear fruit ten years from now. And over the last, you know, two or three uh, parliaments, you know, foreign investors have had to take a bit of a a punt, a bit of a guess as to what that, you know, how that's going to, uh, how that's going to look. So I think it's really critical that the government starts to focus on, you know, long-term structural reforms rather than short-term measures that may suddenly spike the, uh, you know, you know, uh, the equity markets. You know, it's not about short-term victories. It's, it's, it's going to be about balancing expectations. I understand that we need to address long-term structural issues, but in the short term, there's going to be disappointment if he doesn't push some levers to kick off the engines of growth. Yeah, that's right. I think I think uh, that is right. But so long as you know, so long as investors can see that there is a that there is a game plan to get to that uh, medium to long term, uh, uh, you know, that, that medium to long term story, that will be positive. So, for example. Uh, you know, um, being clear on you know particular policies. You, you know, you touched on a moment ago about retrospective taxes and all of those sorts of things. But, you know, investors are looking for clarity um, and they're looking for consistency. And so long as they see clarity and consistency, you know, that's what they're you know that's what will you know be the inflection point for them in terms of investment. Will uh, foreign investors be disappointed if there is no specific? Uh, mention or specific measure to address the retrospective tax mess. If they're just silent on it, will it be a big disappointment as far as foreign investors are concerned, at least in, in the budget? I think it will, and I think you know uh, this government needs to show that um, you know that they are they are listening to um, you know to, 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 to you know some of the concerns of the foreign investors. But again, one thing I always find interesting is that you know you know we often talk about you know foreign investors versus domestic investors. What's actually really important is the fact that you know that uh, you know actually what's good for you know, Indian business houses is, pr is, is, is actually pretty much the story that we, of, of what's good for foreign investors. So, yes, I think there needs to be an eye on specifics around foreign investments, such as, you know, retrospective taxes and those sorts of things. But frankly, if foreign investors can see that, um, that uh, reforms and, you know, uh, uh, and other aspects of government policy is creating a more business-friendly environment, that will be a huge fillet for them as well. Okay, uh, that's the view from London. Let me get uh, Ashok Pabla back into this conversation. Uh, Ashok, will it matter at all who becomes the finance minister? Or, or really, does the market and do investors care about the fact that it's Modi at the center? Well, I guess, uh, you know, given that this is now uh, a much bigger role at the national level, uh, Mr. Modi will have to, uh, you know, form a cabinet, a government, of course, which is of his choice and with whom he can work but where individuals will have to be given responsibilities and will be, have to be held accountable. So my own view is that he's going to change his operating style from the way he managed Gujarat and have a team working along with him, but he will, of course, hold the team very accountable. And, and I will not be surprised if people who don't perform uh, to their stated agendas uh, are changed because uh, you know accountability effectively means that underperformance and overperformance have both to be rewarded negatively and positively. So I do think that uh, the appointment of a finance minister, uh, albeit of his choice, will be a very important appointment, and the market will look at that quite closely and, and be very interested in it. Oh, they will most certainly look at it very closely. But uh, Sanjay, before I let you go, which of the sectors that you see capital coming into, given where we are today? Well, I think, you know, it's, uh, it, it doesn't take a rocket science to, to figure those out. I mean, infrastructure is a big, big 
um, sector of, uh, of, of importance. I think I'd like to see more around, you know, sort of engineering, manufacturing. India has to create a phenomenal number of, you know, manufacturing jobs, um, you know, to, to help it grow over the next 10 years. And I'd like to see some, you know, some policies that allow, you know, foreign investors with, you know, uh, with the appropriate R&D, with the appropriate uh, sort of engineering capabilities to help uh, India drive and fuel that growth. All right, Sanjay Thakur of KPMG joining us from London. Thanks very much indeed. Sanjay, uh, 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 Mr. Vaza, let me very quickly put that point to you, Ashok, uh, as well as far as where you actually see money coming in and what kind of executive decisions you think we could see. Uh, forget the legislative action for a moment, but executive decisions that could actually help maintain the momentum that we're seeing in the market. I guess, uh, you know, the power sector uh, appears as the most obvious uh, one yearning for, for support where uh, just simple executive execution and implementation of some framework can help ease the bottlenecks that are today holding back significant number of, of power projects. But I would argue that, you know, similar changes and executive authority can be applied across several segments. I mean, you know, what is he going to give message around manufacturing? Remember, a large mandate has been offered to him because of his focus on employment and, and his mantra that manufacturing alone can solve India's long-term employment or unemployment issues. So, you know, any signaling in terms of how he's going about it. Uh, there are projects that are held back because of environmental clearances, how he goes about dealing with those projects in the short term. I think those are some of the low-hanging fruits that he'll need to address early. All right, those are the low-hanging fruit. But let me come to you, Subir Gokharan, in terms of how they can address this issue of uh, the welfare schemes and the entitlement-based programs that the Congress rolled out. You know, I was having an interesting conversation with Mohandas Pai where he said he should treat it with benign neglect. So you don't really <laughs> try and undo anything, but, you know, you don't push that case forward either. Do you think it is going to be benign neglect? Uh, well, that's very easy to do in government is, is neglect, you know, benign or malign, you know, as, as I think about difficult choice. I think there is a, there is a fiscal dimension to this, uh, and I, uh, you know, remind you of uh, Mr. Pranab Mukherjee's 2012 budgetary promise of reactivating the FRBM yep. with a new element, which was a cap on aggregate subsidies. I think that's a very important instrument here. If you cap subsidies, mm. then you force the government to make a choice between uh, you know, food and fertilizer or food and fuel. Uh, if you want to go the whole hog on food, then you have to make compromises on, on fertilizer and fuel. So I think that is a good approach. I don't think we can, we can root out subsidies entirely, mm. but by capping them, we're doing two things. One is we're reducing the fiscal risk of a blowout on subsidies, which is what we, in a sense, experienced in, during the UPA regime, mm. but also we're forcing the government uh, agencies to conserve, to deliver efficiently. Right. And that incentive, I think, is absolutely critical to make these schemes operate. Our concern is not so much with the schemes themselves, mm. but the fear that there is so much leakage and diversion and inefficiency that they end up costing you a hell of a lot more than you expected That's and right. not delivering on what they were promised. So that balancing act, I think, has to be built in in terms of uh, incentives and penalties. Right. Uh, and I think that that's really where the solution is to lie. Not benign neglect, <laughs> but, but much more efficient uh, sure. management. Well, we've now got with us Jagdish Bhagwati of Columbia University. Mr. Bhagwati, appreciate you joining us here on CNBC TV 18. Uh, are you getting ready to move to India, sir? I seem to have lost that link with Jagdish Bhaguti, but of course, uh, along with Arvind Panegria, uh, one of the architects uh, as far as Modi's development model is concerned, or at least an advisor to Narendra Modi and his brand of economics, we'll try and go across uh, to him and get his points of view on what he sees uh, uh, from here on. Uh, Geeta Gopinath, the conversation that I was having with Shubir Gokharan uh, on, on the issue of subsidies, capping subsidies, the benign neglect of welfare program and welfare schemes that the Congress rolled out. Uh, your quick take on that. Well, Joel, I think what was, what's uh, interesting is if you look at the... Uh Welcome back. You're watching our special coverage on India Business Hour. We're decoding the Modi victory and what it means for the Indian economy. Let's hear out some global voices on where we could see the economy headed and on the key reforms that they expect the Modi government to take. Uh, I would like to see some movement further 
towards uh, capital expenditures. They, you know, these used to be around 2003, uh, about 4% of the GDP. Uh, today they have gone down in the central budget to about 1.75% of the GDP. I would like it to go up a little bit to about 2% or so. so. I think that inflation needs to be, and so like on the 2nd of June, my suspicion is that uh, uh, the RBI will stand pat, and it should, uh, given the fact that we're seeing at least some stabilization like in inflation, but it should be no hurry to cut interest rates, and Modi should fully back Rajan and sort of quash any speculation that he's going to be changed, because doing that really is a damaging thing. I think this is a very, very important endorsement of economic reform, an electorate in India going out asking for a better growth environment, uh, voting for an administration that has the reputation at the state level for getting things done. Uh, foreign investors are certainly going to welcome this, as I'm sure domestic investors will welcome it. And now we need to get into the nitty-gritty of what the BJP-led uh, government is required to do and what they can do within some of the constraints, such as a fiscal deficit, uh, which needs to continue to decline to keep the rating agencies happy. In a sense, Mr. Modi has also come at a weak point in our economy, in confidence, and therefore, obviously, he will do his things, but he will get full credit for his good timing, because after some time, anyway, the new cycle was supposed to start. It just needed a little bit of a prompt so that investors and everybody else can give the new management time. That means you will not tomorrow worry about inflation being 0.2% higher because it doesn't matter. Right now, the bigger thing is that we have this new guy on the you know, leading the country and therefore you will ignore for many months. Rating agency now cannot downgrade, they'll have to wait for the budget. Well, so confidence brimming over there as far as investors are concerned. Markets touching new record highs today. We did see some profit booking coming in, but 25,000 was breached along with the Modi rally today. So let's listen in to where the markets could be headed. Here are the most influential voices talking about levels and how much steam this rally has left. I really look for very, very solid growth. Uh, I think uh, some of the ways that we think will become irrelevant. Uh, you know, I think for the first time in my investing career, I have seen people vote for development and growth the way this time it has happened. And it is across the country from north to south, east to west. And this is very, very big. This is true economic independence, according to me, because I've never seen people, you know, people believed in a man. I think this time people are believing in themselves, in aspirations, because they have rejected, you know, the ideology of doles and you know my bap sarkar it is they on i mean they, they really have joined the aspiration uh, bandwagon and i think that's very exciting well influential market voice is there but let's go across now to jagdish bhagwati joins us from columbia university mr bhagwati professor bhagwati appreciate you joining us here sir in india business hour let me start by asking you sir are you getting ready to move back to india seems to be not our day with Jagdish Bhagwati. We seem to have lost that uh, connection once again. We're trying to figure out what exactly the, the problem is, but uh, uh, you heard from Arvind Panigria, his, uh, his colleague who spoke with us just a short while ago and drew up, uh, if I have my notes with me, an eight-point agenda for the next government. Will he be the chief economic advisor, as the buzz is suggesting? We don't know. But... Uh, we're completely out of time here on India Business Hour. It's been a long, long day, a historic day for India. A majority government after 30 years. Narendra Modi will be Prime Minister. We understand that the swearing-in could in fact take place on the 21st. Growth imperatives, policy imperatives, you've heard it all. Foreign investors, domestic investors, FIIs, you've heard it all right here on CNBC TV 18 through the day. From all of us here on the team, goodbye. Many thanks for watching.